Hey writer, if you're ready to level up, then buckle up. Get your pen and paper ready. It's time for another episode of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. I am your host, Chris Jones, where today I'm joined by my friend, David Brown. David is known as the Evangelist of Authenticity and is an ordained minister and evangelist with the Christian Church. With 24 plus years of ministry experience, David has had the privilege of leading within seven different congregations. He's also instrumental in establishing three additional church plantings. David's background has been helping organizations with both transitional leadership and leadership development. He's passionate about the development of every organization's greatest resource, their people. He has taught and trained on every platform from mentoring to workshops and executive coaching. And today, David and I are going to talk about how public speaking impacts writers and why writers need to become exceptional public speakers, not just for the sake of sales, but because it matters in terms of connecting with your reader. So without further ado, here's my talk with Dave Brown. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. And I'm with Dave Brown today. Dave, expand upon the bio that I just shared about you. Well, Chris, I'm really thrilled to be able to be on your program and to share with your listeners. I am a public speaking coach. What I tell people all the time is I help bring out the very best in them. And so when you think about the world's greatest athletes, the world's greatest performers, you're talking about symphonies, you're talking about ballet, they all use coaching to get a winning edge. I provide that winning edge for the executives and the organizations that I support. So that's what I love doing. I am a speaking coach, I'm an executive presence coach, and I bring my background as a minister of over 25 years into that situation. So that's who I am and that's what I do. And at the same time, I run a company called DSB Leadership Group, as you know, Chris, and my twin brother and I, I have an identical twin. We actually have a podcast called Twins Talk It Up. So we're also using that platform to get our message out there. Now, I love that you said that you give people a winning edge. I think that's such a critical thing, uh, you know, when you're in the space, you know, writing books and you're, you're trying to reach audiences that you always just want to have some sort of an edge, which is why, I'm, I'm grateful to have you as a guest. You know, you're an executive and leadership coach, but you also provide public speaking training. Talk about that a little bit. Yes, thank you for asking, Chris. Uh, with my business and with my practice, I believe so much in the focusing on the mindset, the mindset of the professional. And if we can get the mindset where it needs to be at and we change that belief system and we get them focused on seeing the best version of themselves, everything else that follows is that much easier. And as a public speaking coach, what I believe in my training is that no matter the industry you're in, you can always improve your speaking skills. As a matter of fact, the great Warren Buffett said that for a professional, this is the most important skill that they can learn to go after. And that he believed that if a professional can learn this trait or learn this skill set, that they can increase their value by 50% more. Think about the career growth. Think about the opportunities at your workplaces. Think about that job promotion that you want. All of these can be enhanced by mastering your speaking skill. So it's my goal as a speaking coach or a public speaking trainer to help them to become more effective in this skill, to become more confident in how and really how they see themselves and thus accomplish those goals. You know, that's something you mentioned uh, you talked about mindset. I know mindset is, it's, it's everything, you know, yes. when it comes to anything you do, you know, you, like they say, you know, you'll do anything, you'll do everything the way you do anything. And, uh, and it all starts with mindset, believing you can do something, knowing you can do something. And our minds can work against us in so many ways. I feel like as Americans in general, we have this, like, when it comes to promoting ourselves or talking about the work that we do, we have this false humility, like self-deprecating nature. How do, you, how do you coach that mindset up to being something that's more confident where it's not like this self-deprecation, but it's like, it's, it's confident, but it's still humble. Right. And that is a fine line. It really is. 
And for a lot of my clients, we talk so often about what we call the imposter syndrome is and how they are to see the best version of themselves, how they're not to think that someone else could do better, someone else is more qualified. There is a fine line, but I rather that my clients err on the side of I am the stuff, I am the woman, or I am the man than in the opposite end. Because if they're on the opposite end of that spectrum, I've got so much work to do to pull them out of that, whether it's a bad experience they had, whether it's something that that they, that happened at their job. These are things that I've got to work through. So for me, I say, let's work on seeing the best version of yourself and realizing that if you're not confident, why would I be excited to hear from you? Or why would I want to accept what you're trying to sell me or what you're trying to present to me? So you've got to be passionate. You've got to be confident. And I'd rather that you err on that side than to err on the other side. The other thing, Chris, is this. If you are good at what you do, you don't have to self-promote. You don't have to say, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. People already know that about you. And so you can speak from a different position. Instead of I, 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 you can speak from what I've learned or what we've seen or what we've experienced. Then people, be they're able to see you and not see this arrogant side of you. But trust me. There are speakers out there that do come across as arrogant. That's their style. And it's very effective to some people, but it's not for everybody. Right. And I know that as an author, you know, I mean, confidence is going to, it's going to equate to sales. You know, when you're going to book conferences, you're going to festivals, just having that confidence to speak up is going to equate to sales. So I'm glad you mentioned that, just the whole idea of just being confident and where confidence takes you. Um, as far as public speaking, what does that entail? Like, give, you know, what does public speaking mean in a nutshell? That's a great question, Chris. When people think public speaking, the image that often comes to their mind is someone who's speaking as a keynote speaker in front of thousands. This is like the Tony Robbins speaking in front of thousands of people. This is like the TD Jake speaking in front of thousands of people. And so they'll either think it's a professional keynote speaker or they'll think it's a minister or some clergy member, but that's not true. Public speaking can be just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's any time you're giving an idea, you're sharing a concept or a thought, whether it's with one person as an audience or with thousands of people, those are all aspects of public speaking. So why are most people terrified to speak? Oh, I love this question, Chris. Thank you for asking. Glossophobia has actually been revealed through research that more people, and here's a joke, are wanting to be in, in the coffin than giving the eulogy, right? People are wanting to do it. They're more afraid <laughs> of speaking, yes, than they are of dying. <laughs> and so you can say, I don't like clowns or I don't like spiders. I don't like whatever, but people are terrified of speaking. And I'm gonna tell you why, Chris, this is from my experience. People are afraid of speaking because they're afraid of being judged. That's what it is. They don't wanna be judged. They don't want people looking at them, making all these assumptions. And so if they were not afraid of being judged, they would be able to give differently. They'd be able to speak with more confidence. But when you're sitting there and you're worried about what people are going to think about you and you're worried about how they're going to judge you and look at you after what you share, or what you say or don't say, that's where fear comes in. Now, I also believe that there's not a person alive that could claim they've never been afraid to speak or never had to deal with their nerves. That's there. But for you to say, I don't want to speak because I'm so afraid, you're not getting in touch with what's really going on inside. And what's going on inside is mostly mental than anything else. And once you can get through that portion where you can really come to conf uh, literally confidence and really come to grips with why you're there, the fact that they need to hear from you, you can work through your fear. And I do sorts of exercise workshops. I teach them everything from word replacement to emotional placement to breathing techniques. There's things you could do to counteract when you're afraid. But at the end of the day, if they can push through that fear, Chris, and they can use that energy that comes from fear, they're going to be great. But I also want them to know this. When you think about fear, why we have this sense of fight or flight, instinctively, it's there to preserve us. It's there to protect us. But if we understand that we could take that same energy and instead of worrying about how people are going to come at us, but we can look at it, how we can give to the audience we're going to be speaking or presenting what to, it's actually going to aid you. 
So don't be afraid to speak. Don't look at your nerves and what you're afraid of as something as why you can't give or why you can't share. It actually can help you to become a more effective communicator. Yeah, I was uh, reading something, maybe it was last year, by, about Tom Brady. You know, Tom Brady's played in, what, nine, ten Super Bowls, won seven. And he says that he still gets nervous before every single one of them. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think you know, people tend to think that, you know, in order for me to do anything, to speak or to perform on any level, I've got to have no fear. And that's not true. I mean, even before I even before I hop on a podcast, I've got like butterflies in my stomach every single time I'm talking to a brand new guest. It's like, okay, until I actually utter that first question, I'm still feeling I'm feeling the butterflies, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's just a normal part of uh, the speaking process uh, that people go through. Um, it is. You know, as a coach, how do you tame those speaking fears and anxiety so that people realize that it's just a normal fear and not some like phobia level anxiety that they're dealing with? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think if you're a great coach, Chris, you're not going to do a cookie cutter answer for everybody. You really have got to get deep into their mind, deep into their past to understanding why they're afraid or what could be holding them back from presenting their beautiful, authentic self to the world. And that's what you've got to work on. Now, there are techniques I did mention this earlier that you could do that could help. And sometimes it's what we call mindfulness techniques. We talk about the power of visualization. We teach on how to look at breathing and why breathing is so important. Think about even yoga as an exercise. At the very foundation of yoga is breathing. It's learning how to control your breathing. And I think if you learn to do that, it's going to help you to calm that sense of anxiety. And if you can calm that speaking anxiety, you're going to become a more powerful and effective speaker. But It ultimately starts with that individual and what they're going to believe. Let me share this, if you don't mind, Chris. I've had different clients where I've shared with them what I call transfer of thought and associating different emotions with what they fear. It could be something as simple as how you put on your pants every day. If you generally put on your left, go through your left leg first, change it tomorrow, go through your right leg. Why? Because the very things we don't think about And we put thought in, actually rewires our thinking. And if we could take a traumatic, painful experience and associate a positive one, and we put that positive energy behind it, it actually rewires our thinking. And we actually are grateful for what happened versus thinking that that traumatic event is going to keep us in a state of fear. For example, I had a client of mine who was a professional with a company out of California, she happened to be one of her class uh, school of uh, communications, the queen or president of school of communications. And she was running for the Miss uh, University. And she had this fear that seized her because a question was asked that she didn't know how to answer. And so we actually went back and we looked at that situation. And I said, what if we replace that fear with gratefulness? And she said, what do you mean? I said, the fact you and I are working together today, the fact that you're going after becoming a better speaker, you never would have gotten to the decision if that event never happened. And so she started to replace every time she was tempted to think back to her quote unquote disappointment, she started replacing it with gratefulness. And she said, you know, I'm excited about what happened. I'm thrilled that that happened because now I'm more powerful, more aware, more in tune, more excited about what I'm doing. And it's actually changed the way she shows up to every event that she does. Incredible story about how you can replace negativity, bad experiences, terrible disappointments with something else to become a more powerful, effective speaker. That's a great story, Dave. I love that. Thank you. I appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, yeah. So well, so here's an objection that you'll typically hear from, a, from the writing community is that, well, I'm an introvert. You know, public speaking is an extrovert activity. Oh, I love that you said that. I'm going to tell you something, Chris, that's going to sound interesting for your writers out there. The very best speakers I know, at least some of the very best speakers I know, are introverts. Like, how's that possible, Dave? (laughs) Because introverts, by the very nature of who they are, they're more in tune with how they feel. They, They know what's going on in their mind. They hear themselves thinking. They're more mindful of what other people are going to think and how it's going to impact them. 
And once they can grasp their strengths and what makes them unique, and you really just teach them different techniques, they're the best speakers out there. Because I've heard some of the most type A, powerful, loud speakers out there, and they totally missed the boat and could not connect with their audience. This is why I believe some of the most powerful speakers are by nature introverts. And I love working with introverts personally because they're more in tune with what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and they're able to sense the energy and what the audience is going to perceive or receive rather from them. And that's why they're great communicators. So I love working with introverts personally. That's interesting too, you know, because yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I'm, I'm an extroverted person by nature. I'm, I'm, I'm loud and I'm, I'm out there, you know. But uh, I have a lot of friends who are introverted, and like when they when they share their thoughts or their ideas, it's just it's gold, you know. And it's like, mm. man, you should share that with people. I mean, and the thing is, like, so many introverts, like you said, we're, like we talk about, are authors. So it's like you can already articulate your thoughts on paper. It's just a matter of you having the confidence to articulate what you've got down out into an audience. Yes, so true, so true. So what do you think makes a great public speaker? Oh, I love this, Chris. I love that question. For me, a great speaker is somebody who's aware. They're aware of the audience that they're speaking with. They're aware of a need that they can speak to. And they're confident in themselves and in their voice enough to know that they are in the position to where they can address that need or speak to that need. So a great speaker isn't the loudest person. A great speaker isn't the person who's written the most uh, books or has had the most requests to come and speak. The best speakers are the ones who are in tune with themselves, who are aware of this situation. They believe that they have a voice. They believe they have something to offer. And they're really authentic. And what I mean by authentic is that if you were to use the baseball illustration, they have their own batting stance and they're very content with it. They're not trying to be like everybody else. I remember I was working with a company and the CEO actually said to one of his directors, I just don't understand why you can't speak like me. Wow. <laughs> and he said that. <laughs> and she goes, I'm just not as confident as you are. And I'm just sitting here listening to this, Chris. And he said, well, just do what I do. Put your, your thoughts on a note card and get up there and speak. And I stopped him and I said, let me ask you this. What's your favorite sport? He said, baseball. I said, do, does every batter that goes to the plate from your favorite team have the same batting stance? He goes, no. I said, why do they have different batting stances? He said, because that's their ritual. That's what makes them comfortable. That's who they are so they can be their best person, on the, uh, the best player at the, at the plate. I said, well, what if every person in your company has their own batting stance? And I'll tell you, the room, the spirit room changed. Wow. And he humbled out. And he said, wow, I never thought about that. And she said, yeah, I, I, I'm just not like you. I could do it. I could do it. Just let me do it my way. And that's what's so important. If you could be authentic and hold on to your own batting stance, you will speak with your true voice and you'll connect with people in a way no one else can. Dude, I love that baseball illustration. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a big sucker for sports illustrations anyway. I use them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> as I did earlier, <laughs> but I mean, oh, that that's a that's a perfect illustration though. Just being able to go in your own strength and allowing people to go in their own strength and speaking in a way that makes them feel comfortable. Yes, that's so true. Let's take it back to the micro again, though. So we we talked about like big form public speaking, but how can you know, for writers, how can writers take advantage of public speaking in the vein of it being so? Like, let's say I'm a, I'm an author of a fiction book and I'm at a conference and I want to sell my books, how can I employ storytelling? Because typically that, that would make me a lot more comfortable as an author to speak through the lens of a story. Personally, Chris, I think if you are able to master storytelling, you're going to be that much more effective as a speaker. We all connect with stories. Who doesn't love a great story? You're talking about the incredible setup in the beginning. You're talking about finding out who the hero is. Maybe it's somebody you never would have expected. You find this sense of, of combativeness, you find this sense of conflict and you've got maybe a villain or some challenge and then they overcome it. I, I believe without a doubt, if you could connect a story that resonates with your listeners, that's going to be more imprinted in their mind. And they actually will remember what you're saying or sharing more because of that story. This is why I believe stories are so valuable. It is the oldest art form there is. You pass down stories, stories, 
make important lessons. Stories share relevance of life. So if you're an author and you're a writer and you want to be able to connect with a list, with your audience, find the right story to connect that point and they're going to remember it. I promise you that story will resonate with them. That's why I think storytelling is so important. As a matter of fact, Chris, one of my workshops is entitled Storytelling or Story Sailing. Ooh, I like that. And the reason why is if you tell the right story, you got them hooked, you got them brought in, they're going to be with you for literally the entire ride that you give them. But if you go story sailing and you just go off on tangents or you just get out there like I do in the Chesapeake and you're going on, on a sailboat, you can get lost out there. And before you know it, you've lost your audience. You've got to tell the right story. It's got to resonate. It's got to make sense. It can't be too long. It can't be too confusing. But if you do it just right, you're going to hook those individuals and they're going to love following you along the way. Dan, I want to stay in that vein a little bit for a little while longer, like speaking as sales strategy. Um, you know, something I saw someone do, and I've, I've, I've made, I mean, I saw it and I immediately added it to my repertoire. I'm like, that's really good. <laughs> is that she would sit there and when people would come to her booth and talk to her about her book, she would listen. She just wouldn't say a word. She'd listen, listen, listen. And then she'd say, oh, yeah, you know, I addressed that in my book on this chapter. And she'd read the paragraph to them and people would just buy the book. Like how, yes. how, how important is being a good listener to being a good speaker? Like how, how does being a good listener make you that much more of an effective speaker to people? Chris, it's actually the most important aspect of speaking outside of body language. And the reason why is you'll never know exactly what to present your audience if you don't know how to listen to them. And I, I share all this from my corporate culture training when I get into organizations and I'm trying to help them see what the employees are feeling about them. And I also do this when it comes to helping speakers become more effective. You, you can't really take the same speech. I have keynote speeches that I have, Chris, but I can't give the same keynote speech to every single audience because I might be one week speaking to an association. One week I might be speaking to a high school. One week I might be speaking to a Fortune 500 company. You've got to be able to tailor that. And this is why listening is so important. So I often will ask the event organizer, the event planner, HR director, why are these aspects important to you? What are the needs? What will resonate with the key players in the organization? Because if you could listen for what they really want, and, and what do we want? We want our needs met. If we're honest, Chris, we want our needs met. And if you can't speak to the strings of my heart, then that's not going to resonate. I'm not going to buy that book. So that friend of yours is a genius. She's asking them questions. What is it about th these type of books that you like? Or what is it about this plot that's that stood out to you? What, what was it about your mother that resonated in this book? And then she's able to continue to push that because she heard that from them. And that's why she's successful as an, as a, not only as a writer, but as a, as a salesperson of her work. So I love it. I think it's the most important aspect of speaking outside of body language. So what happens when we don't cultivate the public speaking skill? Like what, like what happens to us, you know, in terms of being able to sell our products, being able to market ourselves as authors, what's that going to do to our, to us as a brand? That's a great question. I love that you said brand. We all have a brand, whether we realize it or not. And maybe it gets perceived differently to other people, but we have a brand and that brand can be tarnished and destroyed with one bad mistake, but it can actually be empowered and highlighted through your work by making the right type of choices. So this is why it's important to be in tune with what you're feeling, Chris, and what you're thinking, so you can convey the right messages. And if you don't, it does hurt your brand. Like people were calling me, interesting enough, the evangelist of authenticity because of my background as a minister. And I would say, I want the best version of you. I don't want you to be like anybody else. I want you to be your authentic self. And they're saying, what does that mean? What is that all about? And I said, well, that's my brand. I'm gonna keep pushing it until you get to the point where you know that when I'm speaking with you, I'm getting nothing but you. I'm not getting you trying to be like somebody else. I'm not getting you pretending to protect yourself or putting on a facade that you think I want to hear. I want to get the real you, your fears, your hopes, your dreams, your expectations. That's the kind of client I want to work with. And so if you can stay to that point and stay true to yourself, that's when you further your brand and strengthen it. I love that. The evangelist of authenticity. That sounds like a a phenomenal title to stick on your Instagram handle. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my website. It's on my capability <laughs> statement. It's it's everywhere. And some people get weirded out by it. What does that mean? Well, I said, you could be an evangelist of anything. 
Yeah. If you believe in something so passionately, you are an evangelist of that. You're an apologist of that. So why can't I be the evangelist of authenticity? Why can't I push out there that I want to see the real you? I don't want to see you like anybody else. Because the truth of the matter is, as an identical twin growing up, I thought my brother was the most, most important person, hero. He was the man. I wanted to be just like him. And people say, but, but you're twins. But they don't understand that I had to learn to find my own voice. I had to learn to find myself. And so even though my brother was in many ways, he's older than me. Uh, and people say, what do you mean by older? Well, it, it's different in my Korean culture and how that worked. But he is a little older than I am. And so I looked at him that way. But when I came to a point where I was comfortable with my voice and I accepted who I was and I loved my strengths, that's when I started to shine. And that's when I started to really believe that I could be more, do more and make a great impact. Oh, that's phenomenal. So what are your top three to five tips for effective speaking? Chris, that's an awesome question. You're giving me only three to five. My goodness. Well, I'll say that. <laughs> I can go on for days. <laughs> yeah, it can. That's how, that's how I do it. But here's my number one tip, and I'll go through a couple of them, Chris. My top tip is this. It's not about you. Whoa, Dave, what do you mean it's not about me? Pow. It's not about you. It's about your audience. It's about your listeners. It's about the people you're, you're sharing your ideas with, people you're trying to influence and persuade. So it's not about you. If you go into your speech, your presentation with the mindset that I'm here to give, I'm here to graciously give to them, then you're going to show up with the right attitude. And you're going to take the pressure off of yourself because you're realizing that you don't have to perform. You don't have to be somebody you're not. You're there to give to your audience. That's why it's so important. So my first tip is this. It's not about you. The second tip I shared earlier is be authentic. Find your voice and stick to it. If you're that guy that has incredible humor when you talk, I'm not saying you're a joker. There's a difference between being a stand-up comedian and someone who can implement humor in their speech. Then do that because that's who you are then they're going to remember that about you. So every time you speak, they're like, oh, it's that guy. It's that person. It's that professional. So number one, it's not about you. Number two, be authentic. Number three, practice, practice, practice. I can't tell you how many people just think they could show up, ad lib, off the cuff, be a great presenter. No, you need to practice. I've given keynote speeches that I've practiced hundreds of times, Chris. You have to practice. Because when you practice, 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 you actually learn to refine your delivery, your ability to connect, your ability to tie in every aspect of what speaking is from your body language to your tone, inflecting your voice differently. All this comes together. And then here's something else I would share, Chris. Work on yourself, invest in yourself, whether you're watching speeches, whether you're taking speech courses like mine that I offer, or you're involved in speech groups, find out opportunities that you could grow in your own ability. So get involved in watching speeches, get involved in working with speech groups, get involved in working with speech co courses and speech coaches. These things are very, very important. So if you could do these things, I believe you could become a very effective speaker. On that note of speeches, you know, who are you, who are some of your favorite speakers and why? I love it. Thank you for asking a great question. I will say this. I don't have a million dollar retainer pol policy like some of these <laughs> famous speakers in the world, like Tony Robbins and stuff. But when you get on the stage, you have to believe that you are a great speaker. And I do. But there are different speakers that resonate with me based on what I'm working on and what season I'm going through. But I'll tell you some of the, the ones that I really enjoy listening to now. I'll give you three of them. And the first one is Eric Thomas, E.T. Oh, Very yeah. passionate. His stories. I mean... I don't know how you can't listen to him and believe that you could break down a, a wall with him. You know, this guy makes you feel like you could overcome anything. You could go through anything. That's E.T. Eric Thomas is one of those speakers. Gary V. Why do people like Gary Vanderchuk? Why do they like Gary V? He's raw. He's not, he's not trying to pretend to be somebody else. He doesn't want to have his words, quote unquote, polished. I like him because he's raw. Now, yes, sometimes it's a little extreme for me because of my background and my experience, but I, what I love about him, Chris, is that he's very raw. He tells you what he's thinking, what he's feeling. In one moment, he can make you believe that you could be the best marketer out there of your, of your product or service. And the next moment he might chew you out because you're not taking advantage of something that's changing this 
economy that we're in. Okay. And, and then I've got to add a, a former president Barack Obama in there, his mastery of words. I'll tell you something that's mm. so simple. People understand, ask me, Dave, what about marketing and how do we use this? The rule of three, there's all these different things, but he does something very simple, repetitive. This he might repeat a phrase. You remember when he was running for president the first time? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And it's just so powerful. It resonates. Every time he speaks, you can tell that he has such a mastery of words that he knows what he's about to say. And then he'll repeat an image or a phrase that gets implanted in our mind. So I, I love hearing from Barack Obama. I mean, I literally love hearing him speak no matter what the situation. So those would be some of my current speakers that I love hearing from today. And literally, I'll go on, I'll see them on YouTube, I'll see them on a TED Talk, or even with Gary Vee, I actually subscribe to his two of his podcasts and I'll listen to what he's sharing there. But it's incredible, incredible stuff. So these are some of the speakers I enjoy hearing from. Oh, no, that's, that's a great, uh, that's a great cast you got there, though. <laughs> it's where it's what i need i oh, tell you I, it changes good. it does change but these are the ones i enjoy hearing well from. i like how dynamic those choices are like you said eric makes you feel like you can run through a wall he just i mean he just goes right to the meat right to the heart mm -hmm. uh you know and of course you know gary is just so brag is brash and he's himself every single time isn't he and then barack obama <laughs> just, he just has this calm very calm almost like big brother like tone you know uh, and he's such a great, <laughs> great example for what I was going through. When we think about the the nation and where we were at, and you think about a young, younger senator having the ability to connect with all types of audiences. Think about who he was speaking to. It, it, it blows my mind how he was able to do that. And I still believe that when it comes to speaking and speeches, one of the best out there, truly one of the best. And I have no doubt that uh, if we can learn from watching him have control of his stage, so to speak, then we all can become better speakers. Oh yeah, he's like, when I watch Barack Obama, I think the biggest thing that stands out to me in his speeches is he's mastered the use of the pause, like nobody ever Yes. Seen. And matter of fact, Chris, if you don't mind me sharing, what I tell people all the time is remember the power of the pause. You know, silence can be a good friend, but it also could be an incredible, challenging environment to be in when you gave give a point when you make a statement and then the crowd is silent. And what happens with the, what I call filler words, um, and you know, and like people tend to just go on and they ramble because there's nothing being put back for them. And what I call feedback, if you can remember the power of the pause, it actually help you to control your filler words. And it will also help you with dealing with your nerves because you can collect your thoughts. You can collect what you want to say, and then you could go forward again. And it also gives your audience time to process. Maybe you made such a powerful point and they're, it's, they're just trying to soak it in. And that's why you don't get the audience feedback right away. So you've got to remember the power of the pause. It can be very helpful. Oh, it is. And I think from a, a sales perspective, like, you know, we talk about speech and sales, like when you're in front of someone with your book and you're talking to them and you've made the passionate speech about why they should buy your book and you put the book in their hand, shut up. Just be, uh. be quiet. Don't say another word. I think we get this thing where we have, we feel like we have to keep talking because they haven't said anything yet. And like you said, they're processing, they're thinking about, well, do I want the book? Man, this is pretty good. Man, that's a great story. Hmm, it's only 15 bucks. They're, they're processing all these things. And in our mind, <laughs> we're so antsy and nervous that they're about to reject us. We keep talking until they do reject exactly. us and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. You know? And so I think, yeah, just that, that pause of just, okay, here's the book. You hold on to it. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to shut my mouth. And I'm gonna wait for you to to hand me a card, and I'm gonna swipe that. But that's how we have to be, you know. Like I said, mastering that pause and being comfortable in silence, because most people aren't. So if you can be comfortable in silence longer than the person across the table from you, you'll win. Yeah, exactly. Agree. So let's talk about code switching a little bit. You know, as authors, I think you know many instances where public speaking training would benefit uh, benefit us is learning how to code switch. You know, whether that's selling books at a festival, whether that's being on a podcast, whether that's keynote speaking whether that's doing a workshop or a seminar, because each of these audiences are different in nature. Yes, each one you speak yes. to is different. So you have to learn how to code switch and talk to each and every audience in a way that they can pick up what you're putting down. Can you talk a little bit more about why that's such an important skill for an author to have? Sure. I th well, here's what I think, Chris. And typically because I grew up in a biracial home, it would literally help me to understand that if I'm around, let's say, a predominantly Asian environment, 
or my Korean side of the family that there were certain terms or phrases and literally how I connect with them, I would use. Then if I was with my, let's say, American side of my family, that they were illustrations or imagery that they could not connect with because it was from my Korean culture or my Korean side. And so this is where I think as a speaker, you have to ask yourself, okay, where am I? Who am I speaking with? What is the community or the audience? What are they want to, going to perceive? What are they going to take away? And if you could literally put yourself in their shoes, you know what's going to resonate with them. I remember giving a speech once and I was speaking in Ohio <laughs> of all places. And it was really an, an interesting environment because when you're in Columbus and you're speaking and there's this big rivalry with the University of Michigan, okay? They don't even call each other by the school's name. Ohio or the Buckeyes of Ohio State, they'll say this, it's the team up north. And if you're in Michigan, you, they'll say, oh, it's the team down south. They, they won't even acknowledge each other. So it would really be tone deaf of me to go give the same speech that I gave in Columbus as I would in, let's say, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I would use illustrations and t literally not share illustrations or things that would connect with them, whether it's the, the community and what they eat, what they wear, the fight song. You got to be in tune with that. And so I would say for authors out there, because I'm, I'm an author now, I'm, I'm writing, I'm trying to be like you, Chris. If I'm going to present my books or my ideas and I'm speaking in the South or I'm speaking overseas in Europe, I've got to be in tune with the cultural norms, the way that I'm going to be perceived. Because if I'm not in tune with that, I'm not going to connect with them. And we all know that if you can't connect, you're not going to increase your sales. You're not going to increase your, your brand or your ability to convey your thoughts and concepts. So this is why it's so important. And I know for those people who are multilingual, they'll tell you it's hard because sometimes you gotta think in that language. You gotta put yourself in that place to say, if I was in the South or if I was at this company, what's gonna resonate with me? And speak to that. That's why I think it's so important and why it's vital as a speaker, as an author, that you learn to be able to do what I call the code switching and understand the environment you're speaking at. Oh, very good, man. Way to explain that. I love that. So now on the, flip, on the flip side, how can being a really good public speaker help you to be a good writer? Well, I, I'm hoping, Chris, without a doubt, that my experience in my past allows me to be a great speaker, uh, a great author. And what I mean by that is this. In my experience, I've learned so much to put myself in the audience's shoes. I've learned so much to be able to speak in a voice, I find my voice and speak in such a way that they know it's my authentic self. If you could do that, I believe that that can translate very well as an author because you got to remember who you're writing to. You're not necessarily thinking of yourself as, well, I write the same way all the time. So this is the only group I'm writing to. And you can become tone deaf. There are people that love statistics. Okay. Maybe I need to add some stats or add some let's say numbers to my book. There are people that love stories. Well, let me make sure I'm using the right stories in my book. So this is why I think it's important and how a great speaker can become a great writer because you're looking at those things. You're thinking about how will this make the greatest impact? And if you come from my background in marketing, you start thinking about what I call the rule of three. How can I make this three thoughts, three concepts, three ideas that this audience is gonna be able to walk away with. And so as a speaker, I believe that you can easily transfer that to becoming a better writer if you understand simply the power of your voice. And it's so important to know that if you can change your tone, change your pace, change your illustrations, you're gonna resonate with the right audience. So that hopefully will be something that I think every writer could take away with. If I improve my speaking skills, I can write differently and write in a way that will connect with different audiences. All right. So for authors who want to pitch themselves as speakers or keynotes, speakers at conferences or et cetera, or hop onto podcasts, uh, what's the best way to go about doing that in a way that leaves a strong impression with the, you know, with your target audience or the person you're trying to reach? Right. I love that. And if we were to go back to earlier on in our conversation, Chris, and I shared about how the greatest athletes, the greatest performers, they all use coaching. And so this is how I set my business up to the professionals and organizations I'm, I'm really pitching to. And I'm telling them, hey, if you understand that these incredible athletes, they're incredible, they're like machines. Think about Hussein Bolt. 
How did he get that little bit of an edge, that tenth of a second? Coaching. They understand that from the very beginning. And then how do we take that concept and put it into that space of the workplace or put it in a space where these C-suite members can say, I want that? You've got to put yourself in that in that position. So what I tell my professionals, I actually taught on this earlier this week, Chris, in a workshop on how to develop your elevator pitch. I said, if you can't modify your pitch to your audience, you're going to miss it. But you want to put your pitch in such a way when you're not giving your entire resume, you want to give just enough for them to want to know more about you. Okay. So even though I shared with you earlier about the world's greatest athletes, performers, use coaching and edge, I developed that edge. I never said how I developed that edge. I never said what they need to go through in terms of training or work with me to get that winning edge. I just said out there, I provide the winning edge. And so what happens is that these organizations say, Dave, tell me more. So if you're an author, you don't want to tell your entire book and God forbid Blinkist or Cliff Notes version. No, you want people to read your entire book. You want them to learn more about you, but you've got to say it in such a way that's going to resonate. Either it could be with a powerful question. Okay. Think about a powerful question. It could be with a fact or a stat that, that resonates with them. Or it could be something that you really believe in the depth of your heart as a core belief. And if you could put that out there in a five second, 10 second, 30 second pitch to the person that's walking by your booth or walking by your area, they will stop and they're going to want to listen to what you have to say. So I would say, figure out what that's going to be. What's that hook going to be and use that hook with incredible precision and it will become an effective tool for grabbing the people that need to hear you share. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. So for our audience who may want to get coached up a little bit, who may want to learn more about public speaking, who may want some training from you, how can they find you? That's a great question. You can go to my website. That's dsbleadershipgroup.com. That's DSB as in David Sam Brown, leadershipgroup.com. They can follow me on the different social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, these are the best ways to get a hold of me. Grab me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is actually an incredible way. And matter of fact, Chris, for anybody that references this time that you and I have together in your program, your platform, I'll give them an extra 20% off of any type of coaching or consulting that we do going forward. I will say this, that a discovery call is what I always afford to people that reach out to me because I believe that everybody can become a better speaker. And I believe without a doubt, if they work on this skill set, they're going to see better situations in terms of their career choices, career growth paths, higher income salaries. And I haven't even gotten the stories that I've shared with you about clients I've coached that have gotten increases in raises. These things happen if they improve their speaking skills. So thank you for asking. The best thing they can do is go to my website, fill out an inquiry form, or give me a 15-minute phone conversation. That's the best way to work with me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Dave. It was such an edifying conversation. We learned so much about just public speaking techniques, you know, speaking to sales, how to talk to different audiences, just a phenomenal clinic you put on today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Chris, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be your friend, honored that we can share this time together. And I look forward to you and I working closer uh, together going forward with our friends and the clients that we have and we both support. Thank you again. Me too. Thank you so much, Dave. How's that for inspiring? I hope you take action on one thing you learned in today's episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast and left a review on iTunes, I want to encourage you to do that too. Finally, be sure to visit chrisjonesinc.com to sign up for updates. Don't worry, I won't spam you. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode.